Hello, I'm Rebecca Robertson, Adam R. Flato, founding president and executive producer of Park Avenue Armory. Welcome to our second event of the 2023 Malkin Lecture Series. Tonight, we welcome Pulitzer Prize winning biographer Stacy Schiff, who is joined in conversation by Michael Gately to discuss the life of Samuel Adams and the process of writing this and other biographies. While the 7th Regiment was founded in 1806 after the life of Samuel Adams, the founding members of the regiment were deeply interested in founding fathers and collected paintings of revolutionary leaders like George Washington, as well as colonial and revolutionary era pewter and silver, which you can see in the Armory's library. Stacy Schiff, as I said, is a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, among many other prestigious awards. She also received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and is named a Chevalier des Arts des Lettres by the French government. Michael Gately is Assistant Director of the Center for American Studies at Columbia University and Executive Director of BIO, the International Organization of Biographers. He is currently writing a book about Woodrow Wilson. So please enjoy the program. Um, I'm honored to join Stacy in conversation this evening at the Park Avenue Armory. Um, this is her sixth book, sixth biography. Uh, each of them is very different from each other. Um, but distinguished by the quality of writing, uh, the narrative, voice, uh, wit, clarity, sense of prose style. Um, Stacy's approach to biography uh, is not as just the accretion of facts, but facts sort of artfully arranged, um, sense of literature and storytelling. Um, and Stacy's a rare biographer whose uh, books sort of belong next to each other on the shelves, arranged by her name rather than the names of her subject. Um, what I want to uh, begin with is in this, the revolutionary Samuel Adams, uh, it, w which goes over some of the sort of familiar episodes in American history that many of us may have learned in grade school, um, but begins with an arresting episode, uh, Paul Revere's Ride. Um, at what point did you decide that the book must begin um, with Paul Re Revere? That's, a, that's such a great question. Um, it was 3 a.m., as it usually is for the biographer. Um, and it was, I, mean, I had done a lot of research for the book and realized at one point, fairly early on, that everyone, most of us have in our minds the, the rhythm of the hooves of Paul Revere's horse as he jounces his way toward Lexington in mid-April of 1775, but that I think very few of us have any sense of where actually Paul Revere was going. And where he's going, it's not a huge mystery, but where he's going is to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock of their imminent arrest, because that is his understanding of what the troops are actually meaning to do that evening. So the message that Revere has been handed is to set off at high speed to warn these two most wanted men in America that they're about to be um, manacled and deported to, to London. And the very fact that we know one side of the ride but not the other um, made me think, you know, Sam Adams is lurking in that story, but he's invisible to us, so that's clearly where we start. And also, what better way to sort of ride into the story than on horseback with Paul Revere? At the same time, I have to say that writing Paul Revere's ride is like writing the death of Julius Caesar. It's kind of been done before. Um, and so you do feel this certain obligation to, on the one hand, nod to the rhythms that, you know, those indelible rhythms in our heads, and also to sort of jettison them at the same time. So it was a tricky, it was a tricky enterprise. Um, at one point, you described Paul Revere as trapped in tetrameter. Um, you know, the, I, I, you can't even think about Paul Revere without the rhythm, right? It's impossible to get those to get those that verse out of your head. Um, so we were talking a little bit about this earlier. That the opening with Paul Revere sort of sets the arc of the story to some extent. Um, and to answer the question, how is it that Samuel Adams became one of the most wanted men in America? Um, how did you sort of just decide once you had the chronology in place, um, you know, what were going to be the, the, the starting and end points of the book? Um, let me go back a half step to part, in part to answer your question. Paul Revere's ride, to my mind, is chapter one of the book. It's the book, it's the page I wrote first. But it comes to you as chapter two of the book um, for the simple reason that my editor 
doesn't think that people read introductions. So the introduction, which precedes it and which I wrote last, is now chapter one, and Paul Revere is chapter two. So um, it's a little bit chapter one masquerading as chapter two, for starters. Um, Adams has an odd life, an oddly misshapen life, in that he is a failure until middle age. He does nothing, really, in, of distinction until he's in his early 40s. And then for 15 years, he is, according to his contemporaries, the eminent man, the prime mover behind the revolution, the eminent man in the opposition. In Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor's words, the first to advocate for independence. And then post-revolution, he falls out of the picture for reasons we can talk about. So you have this kind of um, startling and really um, just shining 14 or 15 years in the middle of the life when he is really everywhere at once and kind of running circles around crown officials, and then, and then a sort of undistinguished third act as well. And so I think early on, um, it occurred to me that it was a life in three acts, and that um, act one was very little documented. We can talk about the documentation. And act three was very well documented, but no one wanted to read about it. <laughs> and therefore, I wouldn't write about it. Um, so in terms of act one, sort of as, as you describe, Adam's kind of gives great hope to those of us who are late bloomers. Um, I, I don't know why I find it so appealing right, that he doesn't, he really just shifts around town, he tries certain things, he fails at pretty much everything he tries, he inherits a little bit of a fortune, he dissipates it, he starts a business, he, he fails. I just, I find that so deeply appealing. <laughs> and I think you describe him as the worst tax collector in the state of Massachusetts. I mean, the fact that a man who couldn't keep a ledger sheet um, takes on the job of tax collecting. I mean, and, and I should say that tax collecting at this point in Boston is an interesting assignment. First of all, most people preferred to pay the fee, to pay the fine and get out of having to do it. So it was a very unpalatable assignment. But the way you made money doing it was that you got a premium on the taxes you collected for the for the town. On the other hand, if you failed to collect the taxes, you were on the line for the monies that you failed to collect. And Adams, <laughs> it's quite a system, and Adams distinguishes himself year after year. I think he's tax collector for six years. You've read the book more recently than I. Um, <laughs> he, he distinguishes himself year after year for being the most delinquent tax collector to the point where he runs up this colossal debt, of something like 8,000 pounds, which his friends ultimately chip in um, and pay off for him. And you said, just to put that amount in, in context, that it would be the equivalent of donating several buildings to Harvard? I mean, it was a colossal sum of money, yeah, which, cha which, which trails him for years so that at the point when he really begins to write against the government, to express opposition ideas, many people, many people, especially crown officials, assume that he's doing this because he's just this penniless desperado whose best interest is in overturning a government because he's so deeply indebted. What's the real answer? Why does he, what's motivating him? In my interpretation, and given everything I've seen, um, this enormous obsession with liberty mm -hmm. and this um, conviction from an early age that man will fight for nothing with quite as much passion as he will for his own sense of freedom and that those freedoms are being infringed upon um, by the crown. And that's something to which He's sensitive from a surprisingly early age. Um, he, he goes to, as, as an undergraduate to Harvard. He also gets a master's degree from Harvard. And for his master's degree, um, he writes a thesis for which he picks a subject um, which, is very, which is political and very out of keeping with everyone else's subjects. But it's the subject is essentially, does one owe obedience to the crown um, if, the king if, if the king oversteps, does one owe him obedience? If the republic is in jeopardy, does one owe the king obedience? It's a question nobody in 1740 was asking, but somehow Samuel Adams was already there looking at the way the colonies and the mother country related one to the other and trying to define that relationship, which remains strangely ill-defined for these years, and that will add a great deal to the tensions that build. You, you do a great job, I think, early on uh, discussing the influence of the Harvard curriculum on some of his studies for the thesis, his reading of Locke and others um, who sort of fan the, the flames of liberty or his passion for liberty. Um, it's in opposition to the Stamp Act that you say that Adams really steps onto the stage in Massachusetts. Um, could you sort of describe what, what that uh, scene looks like? 
Um, I mean, some of, some of his Harvard thesis, I think, ends up in the newspaper columns that he's writing. Um, among his failed enterprises, um, it will not surprise you to know that, um, he, that a person who starts a newspaper quite quickly runs up a huge amount of debt. Um, and Adams takes the little um, money that he has and with friends begins a newspaper in the 1740s called The Independent Advertiser. And in fact, there are recycled traces of his Harvard thesis in that paper. Um, but he doesn't really come to the fore until 1764 and 1765, and 1765 with the passage of the Stamp Act, when the Massachusetts House of Representatives will recruit him, although he's not a member of the House, to write their response to the Crown in response to the Stamp Act. And it's not unusual for people in Boston to, to look askance at the Stamp Act. The, the Lieutenant Governor at the time, Thomas Hutchinson, thinks the Stamp Act is an incredibly misguided idea. The colonies cannot support this much taxation at this particular moment. But Adams is known because of his earlier newspaper work to have a particularly agile pen, and that job of writing a response to London is entrusted to him. So that's really when he kind of steps out of the shadows, and partly as thanks for that assignment, partly because he acquits himself so well of that assignment, he is that fall in a special election elected to the Massachusetts House, which will almost immediately begin to speak with a different voice, and a voice that is clearly very much Adams's voice. And I guess the first thing that, the, the most important thing that should be said there is that shortly after his election, um, he and a group of friends arrange for a gallery to be built in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And this was an appalling idea um, to most of the Tories in town because they didn't understand why the, why the rabble of Boston needed to watch their elected officials in action. But it was Adams's feeling, and this is like, cameras in Congress, right, that, that these men answered to, their, um, to, their, to, the popula to the populace of Boston, and so that it was very important for these people to be able to watch what was going on. And that sense of participation in government was very central to his thinking, and anathema, obviously, to the ruling elite. Right. Um, and it was to open the, the public's business to scrutiny rather than for entertainment or theater. Right, although very soon it became apparent, I think this might ring bells today, that the elected officials were performing for the gallery. <laughs> right. Um, so th this is a moment where uh, sort of Adams enters the public record, but a lot of the research that you did um, was tracing him, sort of him out of the shadows in newspaper columns. Um, some, I guess not many written under his own name, more often under pseudonyms. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, because that was like 20 years in the archives. Um, he never writes under his own name. It's the style of the day to write either anonymously or under pseudonyms. So I knew when I started that I had this conundrum, which was figuring out which column inches were Adams's and which were those of other people, because obviously he's not the only person um, writing in praise of what we would today call American patriotism. Um, and I knew some pseudonyms because his great-grandson had written a book about him in which he identified some of Adams' pen names. And I knew others because there had been an earlier biographer um, who had started a book on Samuel Adams and never finished it, but she had identified other pseudonyms um, in column inches throughout other papers, and I had her research materials. This is Catherine Menand. Catherine Menand, exactly. Luke Menand, the New Yorker writer's mother, had worked for years on a Samuel Adams book at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And then, and I know this is your favorite part, um, there was a very industrious 35-year-old hardware store owner in Boston with the magnificent name of Harbottle Door. And Harbottle Door in 1765 um, had this sense that history was being made and he began to keep a newspaper collection of all of the Boston papers, which he assiduously annotated, and he would write comments in the margin, he would identify pseudonyms, he would comment on what um, he believed in and what struck him as, as, Ill, as misguided, and then he wrote an entire index, which looks like this kind of crazy, like schizophrenic index to the entire collection. But Harbottle Door also identifies um, columns which I would not have known to have been Adams's. And then to that, I added some other pseudonyms because it was clear to me that they included parts of letters, personal letters that Adams had written to people. So if they were cribbing from Samuel Adams' personal correspondences, I felt fairly certain that this was Adams. His voice is somewhat distinctive. But those voices could be very different, one from the other. 
and they often have different portfolios. One would be one pseudonym if you were attacking a particular customs official. It would be another pseudonym if you were relitigating the Boston Massacre trials. It would be a third pseudonym if you were writing about taxation. I mean, he writes as Candidus. He writes as, as Populus. He writes as Alfred for reasons unknown to, to any of us. But there are a whole collection of constellation of pseudonyms. Um, and Harbottle Doors archive is in Massachusetts now. It's in the Massachusetts Historical Society, and it's also online now. So it's now you can you can actually see these, you know, these. He writes the execrable traitor next to Thomas Hutchinson's <laughs> name, and you. Know, this is my creed next to Samuel Adams's um, columns. It's quite remarkable. The hardware business was clearly not great. <laughs> um, in terms of researching, uh, you know, and, and trying to discern facts from accounts in newspapers. Um, what is the problem posed by Adam's kind of embellishment of uh, events in sort of the aim of propaganda, uh, particularly with the Boston Massacre? Well, I think you can pretty much, let me just go back a half step. The Boston Massacre, it happens in March of 1770. Adams tries very hard to bully the judges into trying the case quickly while tempers are still flaring. Thomas Hutchinson, who's then um, acting governor, manages to delay the trials until the fall when, as many of you remember, John Adams is actually the, the, the defense attorney and manages to ha see to it that all but two of the soldiers who fired that evening are exonerated, which does not stop his cousin Samuel from spending the next six months relitigating the entire case in the Boston Gazette um, in really florid um, prose, most of which is Utter propaganda, yeah. So I think that you know you can see that what he's doing, and you can see that those are that is being done for a political reason. This is a moment when all of Boston wants nothing more than to go back to um, normal life without all of these street protests, without this constant sense that they are under siege in some way. Samuel Adams alone is the one person who want. Samuel Adams alone is continuing essentially to. Um, press the issue, to see that tempers, tempers against the British soldiers continue, and to repeat every one of these issues over and over in the press. I mean, he's sort of a spin doctor, uh, in a way, right? And it might be pushing it a little bit, but okay. there's a lot of fantasy in these, in these months. I mean, my favorite one might be the, there's a, there's a, there's a civilian that night who dies um, after the massacre. He's taken home, he's severely wounded, he's lying in his bed. Um, and when a doctor comes to attend to him, this um, victim of the massacre says to the physician, I forgive the soldier who fired on me because I could see that, the, that we, the people, provoked the soldiers. They had no choice but to fire their weapons. And then he promptly dies. And that's, that is used in court. And Samuel Adams's take on that months later is to remind the readers of the Boston Gazette that that soldier had been a fairly unsavory, that civilian had been an unsavory character and his landlady had said so, and moreover, he was laboring under a mortal wound when he made this confession, and also, he was a Roman Catholic. <laughs> right. So, sort of casting aspersions yeah. far and wide. Um, and you say that one of the strategies of Adams was to place stories in newspapers other than in Boston, that would, you know, New, New York or Philadelphia, that would find their way back to Boston several weeks later. This was an early kind of American experiment, um, not like a pre-Twitter thing, where he and several friends um, found a, a, a sort of news syndicate more than a paper called the Journal of Occurrences. Boston um, sees its first troops in 1768, which I think is earlier than most of us realize. And when those redcoats march into Boston in 1768, Adams and his friends realize that they essentially need to keep the town at a fever pitch to reject these men. And they begin to concoct these rather extraordinary accounts of um, assaults by the redcoats on the civilians of Boston, you know, people who have bayonets in the fair faces and muskets in their backs and women attacked in their beds and young women harassed in the streets. Some of, it, little, some of this is true, but most of it was manufactured. And those reports um, are very conveniently sent to New York where they're published in, by a friend of Adams is in the press here, and then on to Philadelphia where they're republished, and then only weeks later they make their way back to Boston, by which time it's unclear to anyone whether these things actually had happened. And this is one of Adams's innovations in the, the news business. Um, there's a, a moment where you, you say that uh, you know, one of Adams' talents is that he ambushed language itself, uh, that he started referring in the petitions instead of, he changed townhouse to statehouse. Uh, in one petition to England, he refers to both countries. Um, could you talk a little bit about that innovation and sort of his talent on the page 
uh, which I think is sort of, you know, w one of the reasons why he's so highly regarded rather than as, as an orator. Yeah, I mean, definitely not as an order. And as much as I poke fun at some of this sort of misinformation, it really is in these soaring anthems to liberty and to colonial rights that he shines and that he's and that he should be remembered. And they're really remarkable. I mean, it's very hard to read some of these um, without feeling moved by them. They're incredibly powerful um, pieces of rhetoric. He does take the language and do interesting things with it. A patriot used to be someone who was loyal to the crown. By the time Adams is finished with the word, it's someone loyal to the to colonial rights. Um, the words Tory and Whig are, are, bund are trucked out and, and recycled, which they had not been for some time. Um, Michael makes a good point that at one point he, he refers in a petition to both countries. There's only one country at this point. Um, so, he, so he takes some fairly cheeky, makes some very cheeky decisions in some of this writing. Um, and he does start to relabel things in a way which makes you understand that he's injecting new ideas into the drinking water, which is really his single greatest innovation. And is, is this why he, um, or one of the reasons why he becomes so, so, such a wanted man, um, you know, in the, from the British side? So there's, there's almost no more um, powerful reading than to read the letters of the, of the lieutenant governor and the governor for all of these years. It's either Francis Bernard or Thomas Hutchinson back to London. Um, both of these men, both of these beleaguered men around whom Adams is running circles, are writing diligently because that is their job to report to London what is happening in this most restive of American towns. And re repeatedly they will include with their letters the seditious columns of that week. And many of these columns are not by Adams, by the way. At one point, Francis Bernard, the, the previous governor, started to label them like A, B, you know, exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C in terms of treason. And he's at, he's at like Z by Wednesday. I mean, they're just like, there's so much in the press that, that, he's, that they're sending back. A lot of it is Adams's, not all of it is Adams's. But with each of these letters goes the question, can't we get rid of this man? I mean, these, these, this is sedition. It's very, he's right up at the, against the edge and he really knows exactly where the edge is. And repeatedly to London goes this question of if you, could you please arrest him? Because the understanding is really that if you could just get, just do away with a few scoundrels, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, a few others, this whole opposition effort would collapse. And, it's, and it points to this colossal misreading on the part of London who really feel that this is a very um, local effort. They believe that it's really just a couple of bad eggs. They completely fail to see that these ideas are actually getting traction and that m more and more people are buying into what Adams and his friends are selling. Right, um, and not just by what's in the newspapers, but by the committees of correspondence. Right? So it's, it's not just Adams and a handful, it's thousands. So the Committees of Correspondence, are, it's, it's this horrible, it's very vanilla, I think on purpose name for these committees that Adams had clearly been looking to found from an early, from fairly early on to unite the colonies, basically to bring everyone onto the same page, which at a time when Massachusetts and Georgia communicated with each other through London was very difficult to do. And his feeling was just that if you could found a committee in every town and hamlet that was there to simply register and defend American priv rights and privileges, then everybody would somehow align. You, there could, you could form a coalition of these fairly disparate colonies who all of them had different agendas. And he gets this idea, he, he tries to get it off the ground, he fails. He tries again at a point when London, in a colossal misstep, has decided to pay American justices through directly via the crown. So it takes the judicial system away from the people. And at that moment, there's enough disaffection that Adams is able to start his, get his committees off the ground. And at first, Thomas Hutchinson looks at this and thinks, what an insane and ludicrous idea. And he's writing London about you know, this absurd thing. Who would need a committee of correspondence? And then within a matter of weeks, there are 20 committees. And then there are suddenly 60 committees. And then there are 80 committees. And suddenly, this idea just blooms throughout the colonies. And it explains why, this is sort of late 1772, by a year later, when 342 chests of tea find their way into Boston Harbor, it explains how the news, first of all, radiates so quickly out of Boston and how everyone winds up reacting in the same language with the same passion. Um, in, in terms of the, the famous uh, sort of tea party, which I guess it wasn't called until around 1828 or something, um, what is Adams' role in it? I think the way that you describe it is, 
sort of he's a behind the scenes manipulator who's conspicuous in his absence on the night when the tea is destroyed. Yeah, the headline on the tea is that um, thousands of people are on the wharf um, on that December evening when the tea slips into the harbor. And the next day, not a single person in Boston has seen a thing. So it's very, it's interesting to try to piece together what actually happened. And obviously, two generations later, everyone in Boston had been part of the Tea Party. So there's a whole disconnect there. But at the, at the time, Adams has, has anticipated what's going to happen. He had written a letter several weeks earlier to a friend saying, if something doesn't change quickly, I'm going to report, be reporting to you soon about a non-trifling event. And that non-trifling event sounds pretty much like the tea in the harbor. It's Adams who forges the re-equation between um, the tea and, Ameri and, the, and the peril facing American liberty, who basically has, has been able to convince everyone that to accept this tea, to drink this tea, is to accept parliamentary sovereignty. And 10 years of effort are about to go down the drain if this tea is unloaded and consumed. So that's Adams's work, really. But in getting the town of Boston to meet and to discuss what to do about that, Adams seems to be one of the prime movers. And we know that not because anyone in Boston was willing to say so, but because about six weeks after the destruction of the tea, 12 men who had been on those ships are deposed in London and they safely, an ocean away, are willing to say what actually happened, and they all name Adams among the prime movers. And we also know that he's very conspicuously not on the wharf that night. Um, it's very clear that an effort is made for him and Hancock and a few others to be seen at the Old South Meeting House and never moving from the Old South Meeting House um, so that they could be said to have their hands clean. Um, so, I mean, one of, the, one of the contributions of your book is to bring Adams out of the shadows and sort of coax him onto the stage, you know, where he's, he's really reluctant as a subject of a, of a biography. Um, was that a, sort of a challenge that was throughout your research project? I, I seem to have specialized in reluctant subjects. Um, I, I had the feeling sometimes, you know, it was like getting the cat out of the carrier at the vet. I mean, that's how I felt with him sometimes. He just doesn't, he very much doesn't, he doesn't like the spotlight. One of the reasons why he recruits John Hancock is because John Hancock does love the spotlight, and it was easier for Adams to work through other people in many ways. Um, he gravitates toward the shadows. It's imperative, obviously, that he work in the shadows, given the kind of business in which he engages. And he's not a vain or self-promoting man, which is a shock to his cousin John, who is a vain and self-promoting man. So there isn't that sense of wanting to take credit for things. He's diffident just by nature. And even when told that he needs to step forward, like at one point John Adams will say to him, you, you need to, later in life, you need to collect your writings because without them no one will understand the American Revolution and they will explain it better than would any other set of documents. Samuel Adams never does so. He never writes a memoir, he never collects his writings. Um, so yes, I mean, that's very frustrating, obviously, for the biographer. On the other hand, I find there's something charming in that, in his lurking behind the scenes. More than never collecting his papers, he burns a lot of things. I hate that in a subject, I know. <laughs> we have this account of John Adams watching Samuel at Congress at a point where, obviously, if his activities are discovered, um, you know, he will be deported and tried in, in London. And he's throwing his papers into the fire, and John says to him, don't you think you're maybe overreacting a little bit? And Samuel says, I don't want any of our Confederates to suffer for my negligence. So it's really this feeling of just no fingerprints anywhere. Um, and John later tells us that, at, John tells us that at a later occasion, he also cut his paper, uh, his papers uh, with scissors into shreds and just littered them out the window. In seasons where it was too warm for fire. Yeah, yeah, it's the kind of thing that just stops the biographer's heart, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was quite some time before a proper biography of Samuel Adams got underway. Um, you refer to um, the biography, I guess it was ultimately by his great-grandson in 1865. Um, what was sort of the lineage of that? You know, I don't know what the genesis of that is, except that he had gone forgotten. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is, as I said, his stepping back from the history. A lot of this is his own, he's complicit in his own disappearance. It's his own fault that he gets forgotten. A lot of this is that he's out of step with America after the revolution and therefore he's forgotten that he makes certain enemies, John Hancock chief among them, um, who see to it that he's slandered after the revolution. So, he, so that for that reason too, he falls out of the picture. And I think generally 
when the first um, histories of the revolution were written, it was very important to keep the whole street theater, provocative, anarchic piece out of the picture and to focus on the high-minded ideals of, of Thomas Jefferson, for example, rather than someone like Samuel Adams. Um, but I think that it's a funny thing with history. We very often, I mean, there's often a deafening silence after an event. And the Boston Tea Party is the perfect example. It was the destruction of the tea. It was really never very important. The Declaration, by the way, none of the founders really makes a great fuss over the Declaration. It becomes more important much later. And some of that is that these things are carted out for commemor at commemorative times. The, fifth, the, Boston, the, the commemoration of the Boston Tea Party is when we first begin to talk about it as a, as a tea party. Um, and it sounds better as a kind of costumed adventure than it did as a destruction of the tea. It wasn't, and the act of vandalism goes missing in that interpretation. But this was true with the Salem Witch Trials as well, where um, for two generations, no one said a thing. And, that, and even Arthur Miller talked about going back to Salem in 1952, and nobody would talk about what had happened. Yeah. Um, you open the book with uh, Jefferson's description of Adams as truly the man of the revolution, and there's a really poignant letter that Jefferson writes to Adams. Um, at, I guess it's just after Jefferson's first inauguration, near the end of Adams' life. Um, what does Jefferson tell Adams? So oddly enough, and, and this again was like Paul Revere's ride, Jefferson had more respect for Adams than for any of the other revolutionaries. Um, and there's a real affinity there between the two men, which I don't think most of us would guess at, really. And so when Jefferson goes back to think about the founding ideals of the country, um, he's trying to channel Adams. And the letter which, that Michael mentions is when Jefferson delivers his first inaugural in 1801, he does so after a particularly poisonous election, an election that would seem familiar to us today. And he's trying very hard to make a plea for tolerance after the country has been ripped apart by this venomous, um, vicious season. And he says, basically, we need to come together for the sake of a republic. Um, we need to put our differences aside. And in writing that speech, um, he writes to Samuel Adams and says, I was channeling you. That, that address was actually, you should hear it as a private letter to you. It's an incredibly touching document. Um, and you know, we finally have arrived in port, it's time to rescue the country, and I was essentially asking myself, is this how Samuel Adams would have phrased these ideas? Now, it's really remarkable um, that even though Adams wanted to vanish into the shadows, he was recognized by his peers during, during the revolution. Um, after Adams dies in 1803, I guess about maybe 15 years later, Adams' grandson writes Jefferson a letter that prompts a similar response. Um, where Jefferson elaborates on Adams as the man of the revolution. Um, it, my understanding was that Jefferson, sorry, that Adams' uh, grandson was starting to write a biography of Adams, uh, but never got never got very far. Um, do you know anything about why, what stumbled? I don't know where that what happens there. It's there are a whole bunch of sort of false starts. Um, there are false starts and then there are sort of false hopes and the false hope for me is that one person who does write about Adams is his daughter, Hannah, who wrote apparently a 65 page memoir of her father, which is meant to be with his papers which are today in the New York Public Library, but it has not made its way to the New York Public Library. So if any of you has it, this would be a really lovely time to say so. But I just assumed I would basically be able to reconstruct his domestic life from those pages. There's relatively little, there's a very good correspondence with his second wife, Hannah's stepmother. Um, but there's relatively little about Adams at home. He was a single parent for seven years, which was extremely unusual at the time. Um, he's a devoted father. He sees to it that his daughter is beautifully educated, but we have relatively little about the relationship with his children. And that memoir was what I expected to be able to fill in the blank, and it remains blank. Um, so despite asking audiences to Cough it's up coughed it up. <laughs> it's coughed it up. Um, we spoke at the very beginning about how the arc of the book is really concentrated on about a dozen or 15 years where Adams demonstrates his strengths as a revolutionary. One of um, sort of his foibles is as a, I guess a statesman. You know, he does have this third act uh, that, that's not a focus of, of your book. Um, I wonder if we could describe that a little bit. So a French diplomat at one point um, is posted to um, Washington, to Philadelphia, and spends a lot of time with Adams and essentially writes back to France that 
his feeling about Samuel Adams is that Adams always needed to oppose something. If he was, didn't oppose something, he wasn't truly alive, basically. And I think there may be a kernel of truth in that to some extent. He's not a believer in institutions. He's a believer in men. Um, he doesn't have a lot of interest in um, basically how the political architecture of a country is going to work. And so in these years when the country is really being kind of designed, he's not he's not present at the table. And there's, a, there's an interesting um, exchange with John Adams from much later where the two of them are kind of at odds with each other over what the country should look like. And John Adams very much comes down on the, on the side of institutions and Samuel Adams is very much a believer in the fact that individuals um, should be sovereign in all ways and that one can count, sounds naive, but the, as I say it, but one can count on the virtue in, of a well-educated populace, and that a well-educated populace will be, can be relied upon um, to make true and moral decisions without the assistance of institutions. Right, and education is one of his legacies in Boston, I guess in the 1780s, 1790s, particularly girls' education. I mean, I think all of the founders came down strongly on this point, Adams more so than anyone, because the New Englanders felt this, I think, more so than anyone but that there were two pillars of democracy without which it could not stand, and one was virtue and the other, moral virtue of some kind, and the other was education. And Adams believed um, in free, universal education for everyone, including women. Yeah. Um, one of the commemorations of Adams, at the, I guess the centennial of uh, the Declaration, 1876, you note that a statue was erected um, declaring him a statesman, incorruptible and fearless, and you say two of the three are true. Um, how should we remember Adams now, um, more as the revolutionary than as the, the statesman? I think as a statesman he gets failing grades, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, I also think for those 15 years, as his contemporaries make clear, he really is the man of the hour. And the very fact that he is so much, um, first of all, we have all of their words for it, not a single person fails to say he is the man of the hour. But the fact that he's so much behind the scenes, I think, it, so, so much points to how central actually is the role. Um, probably the best place to read of him, other than in the words of John Adams or Thomas Jefferson, is in those adult letters I mentioned from the Crown officers in Boston, because the, one after another they're sending back reports to London in which they're quoting Adams or they're quoting from his pieces or they're talking about you know the disgrace that he has visited upon him th them this week. He's just relentless in his mission. Um, unyielding in all ways, and yet immensely charming in terms of being able to um, fold people into the cause, to build coalitions, to get people to join in boycotts and protests and street theater. And that, I mean, the street theater really seems to be one of his legacies um, in terms of political, uh, you know, his sort of manipulations, his use of newspapers, writing stories. Um, what do you, I mean, what did, how do you think we should remember him? Like, is he a rascal? Like, is, you know, what? Um, I think he's a rascal in, in the minds of people like Thomas Hutchinson, whom he pretty much dogs to death in a way. Um, I think of him, no, as a sort of sterling intellectual in many ways. I mean, it's funny when you read John Adams on the subject of his cousin Samuel, and, and John is 13 years younger and starry-eyed when he first meets Samuel, um, and very much under his wing in many ways for these years you get this sense of a very different, you don't get the sense of a rascal, you get the sense of this immensely formal, decorous, affable man who is serene in his convictions. Part of that is because he's a man of great piety, part of that is a man because he's such a man of ideals, serene and unyielding in his convictions, and kind and sweet with everyone. He's very sweet-tempered and very, very um, prudent, which is exactly the opposite, I think, of the way he's come down to us. That's right. Um, and I think one of the great strengths of your book is to clarify, you know, what, ought to, what we ought to regard as his legacy. Uh, it's not sort of the cranky statesman. No matter how many pages I write, he's still a beer. He's still a beer. Um, in, in terms of, I sort of want to take a step back and ask a little bit about the editorial process. And when you wrote the book, um, you know, you, you said at the beginning that it was clear that it needed to begin with Paul Revere. At what point did you um, come, come to realize that it should focus just on these 12 to 15 years and not do the kind of cradle to grave obligatory um, biographical tour of every aspect of someone's life. This is where you come up against that great Elmore Leonard line about you want to leave out the parts that readers are going to skip. Yeah. Um, so, 
you go where the material is, basically. And sometimes that can surprise you. I mean, I didn't have the home life because I didn't have Hannah's memoir. But I did, for example, have an incredibly detailed sense of what one read while a student at Harvard and what one wrote one's thesis on while a student at Harvard and what the preoccupations were of the young elite who were coming up in these years. So I had a lot about Samuel Adams' education without having a lot of his childhood in a funny way. Um, so I knew I could do that. And, and I think you just kind of take, you, you kind of go where the material is going to take you. I had really rich stuff, obviously, on the massacre, on the Boston Tea Party. Um, nothing, of course, in Adams' words about the Boston Tea Party, um, except afterwards where he calls it a noble defense of liberties as opposed to a lawless destruction of property, which tells you everything. Um, so, I, you know, you're, you're going where the material is for the most part. I think with those later years, I did feel as if... Um, this was not a man in his prime. He's, he's older and he's at that point in, in pretty failing health. And this was the part the reader was going to skip. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I mean, the, the, what I think ends up happening is that the focus of those dozen or 15 years is exceptionally sharp and that you're left with a, a clearer sense of Adam's contribution to the revolution, if not to the state and the early republic that followed. Um, I think we're, um, we've reached a point where we can open it up to questions from the audience. What I'm wondering is, though, if the British representatives are in power in Boston at that time, why wasn't Samuel Adams arrested when they're sending all these missives uh, back to London, Parliament, and to the king, um, basically saying that the man is a traitor? Thank you. It's such a great question. Um, the, the short answer is there, there are two reasons, really. The first is, as I said, he's so good at uh, respecting that line over which one did not step a toe. So he comes very close to what could be considered sedition. For example, you could say that a crown official should be thrown into the sea, but you didn't say that about the king. I mean, there were certain unwritten rules about what you could say and what you couldn't say. But the other is that in a funny way, he's protected by his own popularity. And for example, when General Gage first comes to Boston to attempt to make some kind of peace out of this disorderly um, town, his first order of business is meant to be to arrest Samuel Adams. He gets to Boston and he very quickly realizes that it's too late for that, that he could have done it on, right on arrival, but that matters have gotten so out of hand that he's missed his moment. And this becomes a problem even at the point of Lexington and Concord where in fact, Gage's orders, and they had come to him in, by several different means at several different moments in, in early in that, in 1775, the order was to arrest Samuel Adams. Gage realizes on the ground that to do that is folly, that to arrest Samuel Adams is to detonate a revolt of some kind, and he realizes his hands are tied. So in a funny way, Adams is protected by his own popularity. Thanks very much. Very interested in your process and you know, in landing on someone to spend years with and whether there was, what was the moment or what was the research into Adams that led you to decide that he was the person you needed to spend that much time with? Um, I wish I had a really great answer to that question. It's a, it's a weird, intuitive, push me, pull you kind of process. I thought I was writing about a medieval woman and in the library in which I work, her papers, her, the books about her were to the right and I somehow kept turning to the left and at three in the afternoon I'd be sitting on the floor reading the papers of Samuel Adams. And at a certain point, my agent said, you clearly want to write a book about Samuel Adams. <laughs> but, and I still might get back to the medieval woman. But I mean, you don't, I'm not sure I ever really know the answer until years later. Um, for example, the witchcraft book, I thought I was writing for various reasons. And only, only afterwards did someone point out to me that I had adolescent daughters at the time. I mean, you, know, you never really notice what's going on in your own life and what might resonate with you at the time. It was 2016. And the idea of writing about someone of tremendous moral fiber really appealed to me. Um, can't say why. Um, and, and I had written, I had spent the previous six years in, or five years, 10 years in Salem, 1692. And you know, one of the, one of the astonishing things about that year is how, how nobody raises a hand and says something is deeply amiss here. And finally, by November, October of 1692, a, 35-year-old Boston merchant named Thomas Brattle finally anonymously and very quietly raises his hand and says, we are going to regret this forever. This is going to be a stain on the New England record. These trials are uh, ridiculous. And I was looking for somebody, I think, who had that kind of backbone. And Adams, it's interesting, Adams and Brattle actually have a lot in common. 
Um, and I think that there was probably some echo of Thomas Brattle for me in the pages of Samuel Adams. Um, Stacy, at this point I wanted to ask, what, it was, what was it like growing up in Adams, Massachusetts? <laughs> well, I grew up in a town that was actually named for Samuel Adams, although to this day my brother doesn't believe me and thinks it was named for John. So that tells you how well Samuel Adams is remembered in Adams, Massachusetts. There's a very beautiful bronze statue at the center of the roundabout, if you can even call it that, in Adams, Massachusetts, population 12,000. And I always assumed that that individual was Samuel Adams. And I think it was only about 10 years ago that I realized it was William McKinley. <laughs> Um, so I am a humble biographer, and I would love to hear you talk about the craft of biography um, in the following respect. I, I wrestle with the relation between ideas, the ideas that I want to uh, bring throughout the, the biography, and plot, and the intersection of plot and the events in, a, in your protagonist's life don't always you know, there might be long, slow periods, um, and you've handled this in the Samuel Adams book in part by leaving out um, the slowest um, period. But I would love to hear you reflect on how, if, if, if you think about plot, how do you think about it? Um, that's such a great question, and you are by no means, you are not a humble biographer, you are a distinguished biographer. <laughs> um, I, I think part of it is that you sneak it in when no one's looking is the short answer. For example, there's, if there's a slow period, that's when you have a, t have a moment when you can kind of expound on what is going on intellectually or what is going on politically in the background. Um, I remember this, and I'm going to use a strange example from Cleopatra's, from writing about Cleopatra. I had this question throughout, which was, what did Cleopatra actually do all day? And like, where do you stick that in the book? And there's a moment where she goes back to Alexandria and basically nothing's happening because things are quiet in Rome and things are quiet on her end of the, of the Mediterranean world. And that's where I kind of stuck in this kind of longish account of what she did all day, um, which we can actually extrapolate from what other sovereigns of her time um, spent their time, spent their days doing and thinking about. So I sort of like to be able to slip it in in that way. It's helpful when you have a subject who beautifully articulates his thoughts, so that with Adams you don't always have to say, you know, here's what he was thinking about, because you can simply use material that you can quote his own work. It's a harder thing when you're writing about 17th century New Englanders and their belief in witchcraft, and you have to somehow convey what they actually thought a witch constituted, which is not what we think a witch is. So then you're having to kind of hit the reader over the head with this like three-ton paragraph of, you know, let me, let me give you the history of witchcraft in five pages kind of thing. And I think, you, I think the answer is you, you're, you're salt, a friend of mine used to say, you put salted peanuts in there. You know, you, you, kind of, you kind of get your reader to the point where they're willing to give you three pages worth of exposition, and then you, as fast as you can, scurry back to the action. It's a great book. Much enjoyed it. Um, something you don't talk about in the book, because maybe you didn't have enough evidence for it, but what destroys Thomas Hutchinson in the minds of Massachusetts is the leaking of the letters back, when which he's talking about all the things you're talking about. Is there any evidence that Sam Adams had any role or was a moving force in making that happen? Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you for the compliment. Um, so H Hutchinson's letters are sent back, portions of Hutchinson's letters are sent back from London by Benjamin Franklin, actually, um, to be read only by a named number of men and by no one else. It is, Samuel Adams's, it is by Samuel Adams's intervention, surely, that those letters, letters are read by all of New England rather than the men who are named. So the, there he definitely plays a role. And those letters are very masterfully diced and spliced in a way that make them look more objectionable than they actually were. And we have no proof of this, but I'm guessing that some of that dicing and splicing would have been done if not by Adams, then certainly with his consent. I mean, he does, is not a fan of Thomas Hutchinson's, and here he had dynamite with which he could, which he could certainly toss in Hutchinson's direction. Um, it's an enduring mystery to this day how Benjamin Franklin came to those letters and had no, and Franklin obviously had no idea what he was sending back. So it's an interesting one because it's something that in part makes of Ben Franklin a patriot as with the Boston Tea Party. Um, but he himself saw no, by, by no means for once in his life, Franklin actually didn't see where that was gonna, how that was gonna play out in, in the colonies. I was 
very curious. Many biographers seem to have a kind of a theme that governs what or who they write about, whereas your books are really all over the map, Riches, Cleopatra, Samuel Adams. I wondered how, how you decide on whom to focus and whether this approach to writing a biography makes it more complicated or in some ways has advantages that are not completely apparent as it would be if you were writing about the same sort of people like the founding fathers over and over? Um, it's also such a great question. I, I've been searching for the unified theory for years and I haven't found it, but I'd be grateful if you can come up with it for me. Um, usually it's like the least likely book possible and that's the one I'm going to write. I have this conversation often with Joe, with Joe Ellis, Joseph Ellis, who writes about the founding fathers and he writes more about the founding fathers and I'm so jealous of the fact that he's on he knows his cast, he's on the same terrain, he doesn't have to reinvent himself, he doesn't have to suddenly learn the intricacies of the Stamp Act. Um, on the other hand, and I was speaking recently to someone who actually does intelligence work, who was saying that he gets moved from department, from region to region every couple of years, because, and, and, and because it makes sense that you would want to have a novel sense of things, and you would want to not be too taken in, basically. You, want, you don't want to go native, you don't want to entirely buy into preconceived notions. And I, and I in my own defense, and I hope I'm not making this up, would say that I do have a fresher perspective for that because I am kind of parachuting in from a different era. And so I do think I see things from a slightly different angle. And, and that's something Joe and I have often talked about, is do you, do you actually have a more open mind because you're not coming to it with either preconceived notions of people you've written about before um, or with a preconceived notion, sense of the entire territory. I mean, I've now written about John Adams from two very different angles, and I feel like I found the same John Adams both times. He's not, he doesn't come off well, I don't think, in either telling. What were his uh, paramount accomplishments as governor? Oh, I, it's a very short list. I don't think there is a paramount accomplishment as governor. I think he's a completely, he's a placeholder of a governor. He becomes governor after John Hancock dies. Um, Hancock dies young, uh, Adams dies old. These are not Adams' shining years. Um, he's essentially elected to the governorship out of respect for his role in, the, in, in independence, his role in the earlier years. And he really is not, a, he's not a forceful figure, he's not an articulate figure, he does almost nothing as governor of Massachusetts. So that's why that's a very short chapter. Can I ask, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about Adams in the course of your research? Um, I think I was surprised by these accounts of how serene he is, because I, you know, I did come to this book thinking he's a firebrand, right? And so the fact that there is this deep-seated sweetness um, really kind of took me aback. And I was surprised by things like the, those, those honeyed notes that Jefferson refers to when he's talking about Adams, that the sense that, these, that, his, that his thinking had so much been absorbed by the other founders, that he is so seen as the apostle of liberty, um, as Jefferson calls him, especially since he's so invisible to us. You know, how could this person who had so embodied these ideals have fallen off the radar? So I've always liked the saying that um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I think it was attributed to Mark Twain. And I'm curious, you know, if you look at today's context and you talk about the importance of a virtuous populace and also well-educated populace, you know, what do you think Sam Adams would make of the challenges that we face today? You know, I'm, I'm not really great on sort of counterfactuals here. I think all of the founders would have been, a, would be just mortified by where we are today. I mean, the very fact that this, that things are so divisive would come as a huge shock to them. For Adams in particular, I think this feeling that his feeling was that a moral people would elect a moral leader. I mean, he just was insistent on that equation. And his political ideas are, you know, so simple, that feel, the feeling that just, you know, the elected official should have little and the people should have everything. It so has not come to, you know, come to that position again. There's a very, there's a very close parallel um, in what I think actually originally strangles Adams, which is this sense that a very narrow elite has its fingers on the levers of power. And that is obviously Thomas Hutchinson and his cronies as Adams would have seen them. And I think that stands in as a sort of microcosm for what they think London is trying to do to them because there is really this sort of almost conspiratorial sense in the colonies that London is trying to exploit them just as there is a sense in London that there's a conspiracy in America to attain independence. And both sides are wrong in these early days. But that sense that there is this privileged elite who control everything 
um, which Adam saw around him, and the cluelessness of that sort of group of very well-off merchants, I think has a real parallel with where, where we are today and with this sense that, that the two are out of touch, completely out of touch with each other. So that does ring very true to me today, as does the fact that this is a moment where there's this tremendous explosion in media on which Adams obviously, which Adams obviously exploits. Um, I see that there are books for sale through those doors. <laughs> Stacy will be signing books. Um, Stacy, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.